Hi, everybody. Nick Tenbrook here. I'm back today with uh, record producer Val Garay. Uh, as a new part of our series, we're going to talk today all about the recordings you made, Val, with James Taylor. So take me back to the beginning and how did all that happen? Okay. Um, I had already worked on a lot of the records with Peter Asher and Linda. Um, I think we'd done the Andrew Gold stuff. I think we may have even done the J.T. Souther record. Um, and James was on Warner Brothers being produced by Lenny Warnaker and Russ Teitelman. Mm -hmm. And um, his contract was about up and um, they were going to put out a Greatest Hits record. So Peter and his infinite wisdom realized that if he stayed on Warner Brothers, Lenny and Russ would continue to produce him. But Walter Yetnikoff was all over Peter to move him over to Columbia Records. So um, Peter went to James and explained to him how Columbia would probably be a better situation for him because it was a new label and they would do a whole new promotional campaign and really push it and all this stuff. And so he basically convinced James that that was a good move. And interestingly enough, uh, I think the night that they were all meeting at um, Nat Weiss's apartment in New York, Nat Weiss was a big lawyer, uh, uh, New York uh, music lawyer. Uh, he had the Stones or he had Mick Jagger for sure. He had... Uh, uh, James, he had, um, uh, um, what's the famous artist with the soup cans? Oh, <laughs> and Andy Warhol yeah. was his client. Anyway, Nat Weiss, they were having a meeting that night with Walter Yetnikoff to sign the contracts to move James from Warner Brothers to Columbia. And in the 11th hour, Russ and Lenny flew to New York and accosted James basically oh, wow. and tried to talk him out of it which they almost did uh -huh. and I think James called Peter at some odd hour and said you know um, I don't think I wanted to move over to Columbia and of course he said meet me at a bar and they got in the bar and had a few sloshy drinks <laughs> <laughs> at the end of it James was convinced that he should do it and so he moved over he went to the to Nat's apartment and signed the agreement, and that now he was on Columbia. And Peter came to me and said, <clears throat> uh, I want to do this album with James Taylor. Would you do it with me? And I said, sure, why not? I mean, I love working with you. I would love to do it. So, uh, And he made me a pretty good offer, mm -hmm. So, um, which I collect on till still day still yeah. <laughs> um so it was a good offer oh yeah really good um but you know and it was also um i think a record that he had something to prove that he could make a record as good as russ and lenny and um we had a great group of musicians we had danny who was in james's original band we had leland and russ who were in james's original band um we had lee Sklar, uh, russ kunkel yeah, Lee Sklar, Russ Kunkel, Dan Dugmore played guitar and pedal steel. Um, I think Waddy played on it too, I don't remember. Well, but, let's let's just go back for a second though, because really he had felt he had something to prove because really he's had a, you know, long-term co connection with James Taylor. Well, he signed James Taylor when he was the head of A&R at Apple Records uh, when James did his first album for Apple. Peter signed him. Was he almost their first signing? Probably. Yeah, I think One so. of the earliest, yeah. uh, earliest signings on Apple. They signed some other groups. I can't remember the names. But yeah. Yeah. And it was a great record that he made. But then ultimately, when Apple was having all their issues, because it was really run by the band. Right. Uh, and they were in... Not run and they, by the band. Yeah, right. And they were in total disarray <laughs> at that time. So yeah. Peter kind of made a move to move into Warner Brothers, which is when they cut Fire and Rain and had that big hit. But what's interesting about Fire and Rain is that originally uh, Warner Brothers put that out and wasn't getting any reaction at all hmm. until Johnny Rivers covered it. Wow. 
he did a cover version. Johnny Rivers was famous for that. He would do cover versions of people's singles, current 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 singles, and yeah. then make them a bigger hit than they had, and he'd get wow. the hit. He did it with uh, the the Funky Kings that I produced with Slow Dancing. Amazing. He cut Slow Dancing and mm. had the hit. The it's a really Kings. good idea, but people just don't even think of it. Now. Well, you know, Johnny Rivers is a very smart guy. Anyway, going okay. back to um, that period, so we had an incredible group of people and something to prove. And we all worked like crazy, crazy hard on this record to make it great. And everybody had the right ideas at the right time. You know, like we did this song called Traffic Jam, which is kind of like a parody in the sense that it was like a 50s song where it was four part harmony. And <clears throat> we kept trying drum tracks, drum stuff on it and nothing sounded right so i took uh, a two inch tape box and taped it to the floor and taped russ's pedals and that was the bass drum wow. and then another tape box was the snare drum and that's how he played the drums on yeah. on that song and then oddly enough in the end of it uh james did the bass voice and that night he'd been drinking so <laughs> his voice went down in pitch and uh, about a week later, we discovered one of the tracks, one of the bass vo vocal tracks were, were out of tune. So we had to get him to redo it, but now he couldn't hit the notes, so we had to get him drunk again in order to get that Exactly, the same <laughs> a drunk yeah, amount right, he can exactly. hit the low note. Yeah. So, um, and also we were sitting in the control room after we just caught a track and Danny and James, actually Danny was playing this, this uh, Otis Blackwell version um, of the Jimmy Jones song, uh, Handyman. And he was kind of playing it, and James started playing along with him, and we were in the control room, and both Peter and I heard this, and went, oh my God, we gotta do this. And we ran out there, because we were in the middle of cutting another song, and we were taking a break, and and so Peter said, we gotta do this, we gotta do this. And James was like, I'm not doing another fucking oldie, period. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, long story short, we cut it that night, and voila, the first hit off the album. The album was double platinum. Uh, Handyman was top five, and it was a great record. And yeah. and oddly enough, <clears throat> I got nominated for a Grammy for that record for engineering. Sadly or happily, whichever way you want to look at it, I also got nominated that same year in the same category for Linda Ronstadt's Simple Dreams. So the vote... You split your me own was, vote. I split my own vote, and then the Steely Dan won the... Darn it. Yeah. Because, I mean, if up. James had just been James, we would have won it, I'm sure. Right. And Doug Sachs, to this day, who's one of the greatest en mastering engineers, uh, who's now passed on, but he was one of the greatest. He mas mastered everything I did for 40 years and everybody else in Hollywood. Sure. Um, he used to use the, uh, the um, high-resolution CD of JT to set crossovers in people's studios. Right. So right. that was a pretty big compliment. In that oh, sense. that's that's great, but almost never happens though mm -hmm. when people run against themselves in the same category. Yeah, well, I mean, think about that. I mean, out of five nominations, I had two. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> didn't happen though. Okay. And I didn't even know I had it. It was funny. I was at my friend Rocky's apartment on Coldwater Canyon, and he's reading the L.A. Times, and he goes, "By the way, Val, did you know you got nominated for a Grammy?" And I went, "What? <laughs> wow. I didn't even know. Nobody yeah. tells you." Right. How are you supposed to know? Yeah. Also, people don't follow, didn't follow those things the way they do now. No, then too, it was at uh, the Palladium, right? The Grammy Awards, and they weren't even televised, right? And I don't think people sang at them either. It was just no. like the Oscars. It was a very Oscarish kind of type yeah. of affair with tuxedos and yeah, that all really highbrow and uptight. And right. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Cool. All so right. you know, the album was great. Uh, I'll never forget the ad for the album with the full page ad and billboard was a picture of James sitting on the front of his car that he had in Martha's Vineyard, which was a checker cab. Oh. He loved checker cabs, so he bought one because they made their own cars, yeah. checker cab company. Yeah. And he bought one and then painted it platinum or they did it in the photograph somehow. Yeah. But it was a platinum the taxi yeah. cab yeah, with okay. him on it. <laughs> well, the musicians end. always loved those because they were huge and you could get in there with exactly. your drum kit or your yeah, bass or anything, something. Anything, yeah. yeah. Cool. All right, so then after that record's a big success, and then what's the next one? The next one was uh, Flag. 
and it was kind of a, a, a difficult record to make and an interesting process. Uh, James had been coming out to the Sound Factory to do JT, and at this point in his life, he didn't want to spend six weeks in Los Angeles, so he kind of said, we're going to have to do this half in New York and half here. So now I had to go to New York and and find a studio that I liked and a place to work, which I did. don't remember what it was, but... Um, did you bring your speakers with you there or anything? Or you, you just know, went there? You know, I don't there? remember. It was too long yeah. ago. Okay. You know, I, I can't tell you. Probably yeah. because yeah. I had flight cases made for the NS-10. So probably did. But <clears throat> I do remember this, that the studio we worked at had a mastering facility in it that closed while I was working there. And I was at the time, it was 1979, I was building record one. So I went down into the mastering room and I bought two Fairchilds, two stereo oh, Fairchilds man. from the mastering room oh, in New York wow. for 350 bucks a piece. Oh my God. <laughs> which are now worth 60,000 each. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I bought two and they're still at the uh, at record one. Yeah. That's but um, so I, <clears throat> I also was, you know, living in the Plaza Hotel. As Which, one would. If well, you're but go when you're York. there for like six weeks, it's it starts to get a little boring, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And, you know, my refrigerator was the, open the window and put it on the, the <laughs> In stoop. the winter. Yeah. In the winter. We were there in the winter and it was cold. <laughs> um, but it's a very funny story. We caught a song um, called Brother Trucker uh, that James wrote. And he wanted his brother Alex to sing backgrounds on it. So... Um, Peter called his assistant Gloria and said, can you book a room at the plaza for Alex because we're going to fly him down from Martha's Vineyard and keep him overnight because we're going to work mm. tonight and probably until the wee hours of the morning. And she calls him back and says, uh, the only thing they have left is a six or $800 a night suite. And he said, okay, well, it's James's brother. Put him in the suite. He checked out of that 33 days later. <laughs> it was a pretty nice suite, huh? <laughs> so that was a, you know, I don't know it was 33 days, but it, yeah. it was a considerable. It was there more than one night. Yeah, oh, yeah. It was a way, you know, and a lot of uh, champagne. Yeah, and living the good life. The hookers yeah. and all that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I don't know. But no, it was funny. And, funny. and we all got a big laugh out of that. Yeah. Uh, and the sidebar to Brother Trucker was when we were back in Los Angeles with James here at, um, sound factory uh we thought why don't we go up on the grapevine with a shotgun mic and tape the sound of truckers tires rolling down the highway and so we rented a limo james and i and peter and got a remote shotgun a shotgun mic is something that you can point like at right. something 30 feet away and it sounds like it's right on top of it yeah so we're rolling down the highway uh on five uh you know trying to record the tires right. of the trucks. And every time I'd poke my head out the window with that thing and aim it at the tires, the trucker would pull over because <laughs> they thought we were part of the EPA yeah, right. <laughs> seeing if the trucks made too much noise or something. And James would be sticking his head out the front yeah. and going, it's James Taylor, we're just yeah. trying to record you. you know. So we never got anything, but that was Brother Trucker. Yeah. And then... The single off that, which to me was probably my favorite track of all the tracks I did with James, uh, was a remake of Up on the Roof. Uh -huh. And part of the reason it was so great is the rhythm track was unbelievable. It was just like a, a 60s R&B song that just was magically perfect. And he sang it magically perfect. The other thing that was great about it is we wanted to do strings on it, and so... I can't remember whose idea was, probably Peter's idea, where he said, let's see if we can get Arif Martin to write the string arrangements. Now, Arif was, at this point, one of the biggest producers in the world, having done all the Aretha Franklin records and all these huge acts for Atlantic. And yeah. you know, and he, he was an arranger, too, which I didn't know. Right, but was, it, was he actually running a label or something? Or no, no, not yet. Or, okay. That was after, when he okay. signed that girl that was, uh, <clears throat> what's her name's daughter? Yes. What's her name? Yeah, Ravi Shankar's daughter. Yeah. A legitimate yeah. daughter. Right. Uh, anyway, so... Nora Jones. Nora Jones. So so I remember Peter calling Arif up and saying, listen, we have a project we're doing with James Taylor. 
you know, Val and I and James would like to come over and talk to you. So we went over to his apartment in Park Avenue. Beautiful apartment. Sure. And Peter approached him on, would you be so kind as to, you know, we know you're the famous producer and we're just asking you to do something kind of menial, but would you be so right. kind as to write an arrangement for this song? Because this is probably going to be the first single. And he he was just the most unbelievable guy I think I've ever met. Just the sweetest, most accepting, honorable human being. Yeah. He proceeded to go down in his basement to his wine cellar and came back up with a bottle of like 1960 Lafitte Rothschild <laughs> that we cracked open to celebrate the fact that he was going to write the string arrangement. <laughs> then the most trying part of it was I decided to cut the strings in New York at Atlantic Studios, Shelly Yakis' joint. Now, mm -hmm. Shelly Yakis was a big engineer in New York and he did things very strange. He had the console built like the BBC so that when the faders were up full, you pulled them down. Backwards. When you when you want to shut them off, you shoved them <laughs> up. And the reason for that was is that a BBC person would be would be working and he fell asleep at the console, he'd pull it down as he fell asleep. <laughs> so they wouldn't go off the air. So now I had to work in, in my mm -hmm. brain opposite of everything that I'd done in my whole life yeah. as an engineer. So we cut the strings at Atlantic and the single big, big hit. And the album didn't do quite as well as JT. It was a gold record, not platinum. JT was a double platinum, and that was a that was a great record. Yeah, but right. my favorite single of James's. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> but just to make sure, now same band, Lee, Russ, Waddy, yeah, with yeah, all the I same so. crew. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's very interesting. I mean, it's easy to figure that out. Yeah. Hang on one second. Grolnick. Yeah. Coach Russ, David Lasley, John Lennon. No, oh. he was a composer. Uh, Arif Martin. Mm -hmm. um, Graham Nash, Arnold McCuller, David Sanborn. It's um, a pretty good group of people. Carly Simon sang on it. Alex Taylor, James Taylor. Right, but Cooch was always Richard part of it. Richard Wachtell and Waddy Wachtell. <laughs> Who's Richard Wachtell? I don't know. Huh. But uh, Cooch well, forgot that he was always, he'd been with James forever, right? <clears throat> Korchmar. Cooch was part, Daniel Korchmar, yeah. Cooch was part of the Flying Machine. Right. Which was James's original band. Yeah, they knew each other since they were like high kids. School. Yeah, 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 high school. That right. kind of thing. So he was always, he folded into the otherwise natural grouping that you seem to always use, which is Waddy and yeah. Leland and those guys. Yeah. Well, <clears> James <throat> and uh, Leland and Russ and um, Cooch were the original band of James's. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so they're still The right. ads were Grolnick and Waddy and... Right. I get you know. it. Yeah. Whoever else of that group. Right. <clears throat> but that was not the period of Andrew Gold in that world. Past. Yeah. Past the period of Andrew Gold. Yeah, right. Andrew was mainly <clears throat> Linda and before that. Except for that one part we were looking at about the, uh, with the accordion. Yeah, well, that was re redoing the greatest hits uh, because, you know, again, right. we couldn't get the tapes. Right, well, let's talk about that. Let's go back and talk about that record. <clears throat> well, the greatest hits album came out uh, but they had two songs on it that were done with Apple and uh, James's right. original years uh, before signing for his first album, and uh, Caroline on my mind and something in the way she moves. And uh, first of all, they couldn't find the tapes, and secondly, Capital was embroiled in a big lawsuit with Apple, and they were going fighting over that. And so yeah. we never would have gotten the clearances to use those two songs, and. And Peter had thought about the, the way that they were done originally, and he wanted to do them both slightly different. So we recut something in the way she moves and um, Caroline in my mind, which I was thrilled to do because another great deal that I made there <laughs> that I'm still getting paid on. Yes. Because um, the greatest hits is at, is at like 30 million. Yeah, but it's a little bit unusual to re-record 
songs for yeah, the greatest Yeah, it's totally hits unusual. I've never heard of it done except for that instance. But that yeah. was the reason that it had to be done because mm -hmm. uh, right. James had done Carolina much different years over the years in the live sure. version. So he did it slower and mm -hmm. it had a better groove. And, and the other one was one of the first songs they cut with James that were just him and a guitar. So something the way she moved, right. he wanted a little more of an, Peter wanted a little more of an arrangement to it, I think. Yeah. All right. That's cool. That's kind of interesting, though, because normally when you, you know, greatest hits is just a compilation. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that made that unusual. Right. All right. And then what? Then when there was the next record after that? Then the next record, which was kind of, um, it was a transitional record for me because I was now starting to produce records and I had a, you know, a couple of big hits. I had the record of the year with Kim Carnes. So I was getting inundated with production work and... Uh, but yet I wanted to still do this record with James, uh, the record called Dad Loves His Work. Right, but at this point now you're in your studio. Now we've gone to record one, yes. Record one was opened in 1980, and, and this record was now being done in my studio. Which you modeled on the sound factory, it's though, a, right? It was an identical print copy of the control room down to a quarter of an inch. Absolutely. Amazing. I spent a hundred hours with a tape measure measuring every square inch of that control room while I was working there the last eight months yeah, so that I could duplicate it in a drawing. And I also had the original drawings that George Ockberger did. Okay. Uh, and the reason I wanted it the same was, um, you know, I was used to that sound in that room. Right. The funny part was that the control room never sounded the same and I could never figure out why yeah. until 20 some years later when I went to a studio um, in Malibu that used to belong to the band that was now owned by Jim Kniper, who worked with me at the Sound Factory mm -hmm. and Record One. Um, and he had the super red speakers, which is what were in the control room at the Sound Factory and the, with the double woofer and the same speakers that were in Record One. But here's what I did at Record One I didn't realize made it sound completely different. But I figured out how to make it sound the same, but it was a nightmare. The box has the speakers mounted in the face of the box, and then the box is inserted in the wall so that the face of the box is exposed. Right. And that's the way it was in Jim's studio, which sounded exactly like the Sound Factory, mm -hmm. and that's the way it was in the Sound Factory. When I built Record One, I hated the look of the box, so I stuck the box in, and then all the oak planking that was all over the walls in the control room, I planked over it and cut the holes for the speakers. And the planking... Yeah. Changed. Deadened the face of the box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I ended up having to do was the guy who worked for me, Leon the painter, he spent three weeks water white lacquering the entire control room to make it brighter. Huh. Which it worked. Yeah. But that's I never realized what the difference was for until right. twenty years ago. So you just every little thing has a huge effect. Right. So, you know, the the record was um was done at record one, and uh, a lot of the engineering after I'd done the tracks were done with Nico, my assistant, who is now mm -hmm. becoming an engineer because I was working on other projects that I was producing. Right. And the single, which seemed to go on for an eternity, was a song that J.D. Souther wrote with James called Her Town 2, yeah. which <clears throat> everybody, when the record came out, thought it was written about James and Carly. When reality it was written about Peter Asher and Betsy Asher and the breakup of their marriage Wow! Uh, because when you listen to the lyrics that they wrote uh, the lyrics part of it says uh, she gets the house in the garden he gets the boys in the band and Betsy actually threatened us with a lawsuit saying that everyone in the world would know that this was about her which nobody ever even no. remotely knows about her in practice probably nobody knew right and uh, you know years later <clears throat> um i don't know if it ever came out but um that's basically what the song was about but yeah. john uh, john david souther you know sang on it with james mm -hmm. and he's incredibly meticulous about how his vocals are done so he probably worked on the vocal on his part for a month wow with of course, Nico. this is pre auto with Nico. Oh, yeah, with Nico. So, <clears throat> and what's Nico's last name? Nico? Bolus. Yeah. He's like my son. He calls <clears throat> yeah. me every year. Hey, Pop, happy yeah. birthday. Hey, Pop, Merry Christmas. He's a very well, yeah, successful... Yeah, he was like, like 18 when I 
yeah. hired him to work with me. As, he was a runner. That's what he started as. Right. And then I got him to work at the Sound Factory. And then when I went to Record One, he came there. And he worked for me for five years. Great kid. Amazing pair of ears. And yeah. going on to have a great he career. He has a great career himself. Is he in Nashville now all the time? No, or he's no? living he goes here. back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, he used to live in Nashville. He lives right. here now. Okay. But um, so I eventually uh, got the record done. Um, the single was her town too. Yeah, big hit. And uh, so once again, you, you you guys are popular with a record label. You every time you go in with these people, you end up having these. Every record has at least one or two big giant single hits. Yeah, and platinum records. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so they they got to be happy when you, oh, you yeah. guys are around. Oh yeah, they were. You know, but it was a great record too. I yeah. mean, you know, it was another great one, but. That's the first one we did at record one. So yeah. that means that Mad Love was done at record one. Uh, Get Closer with Linda was done at record one. And um, and Her Town 2, uh, yeah. uh, Dad Loves His Work, and all were platinum records. Yeah, amazing. So not a bad start for the studio either. No, and when you think about it this way, you know, record one uh, in a five-year period, and how many studios are there in the world in a five-year period, the record of the year came out of record one yeah that's three times out of five years yeah betty davis eyes the boys of summer and rosanna yeah that's pretty good yeah i would say yeah, that's awesome it was yeah, a great run four Fantastic. records you know hugely Huge. i mean the the greatest hits is like i said over 30 million units yeah, yeah. i mean you it still know. sounds great i mean that still sounds fantastic yeah i mean JT's you listen to it today great. yeah yeah it's great yeah, records that's awesome Great. Val, thank you very much. All right. See you next time. Okay.